Still, uh, everybody has, has come in. Still people coming into this Zoom session. So we are just going to wait a little bit for all of them to join us. Wonderful that you're here already. Hilda, shall I start sharing my screen? So we just have the intro slides. Yes, that's fine. Yep. Thank you. So two minutes after, I'm almost there. It's not on presentation mode yet, Young. Yes, this is it. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome by uh, at this webinar to keep our open infrastructures open. This is a webinar uh, organized by SCOS in collaboration with Liber and uh, with Eiffel. My name is Hilde van Wijngaarde, and as a LIBER board member and also a SCOS board member, I'm very happy to uh, welcome you to um, this session. And this session is especially focused on um, how to make that decision to support the open infrastructures that are proposed to you by SCOS. And also a little bit of explanation about how this works and how does SCOS work. Uh, a presentation of our wonderful um, and very interesting infrastructures, uh, Driaut, La Deferencia and ROR. And we hope to explain you a little bit more about them. And then we have a following panel discussion and hopefully that will help you um, decide uh, how to do this and also discuss how you can support uh, SCOS and their uh, infrastructures that are presented to you. Um, and how we can discuss amongst each other how that would uh, best um, uh, be presented, how a university library can present uh, pledging to schools um, to their institution, how other institutions can support this. All those topics will hopefully be addressed in this session. So um, this is a little bit the uh, program that you see here right now. Uh, but first I have to give you a few uh, welcoming and housekeeping uh, um, uh, remarks. Um, we are in a Zoom session that will be recorded. Uh, if you don't want uh, your video, your picture uh, being recorded, please um, uh, turn off your camera. Um, we can uh, um, ask questions in the chat. Everybody that's here can use the chat. Um, you can write them down and we'll pick them up uh, during uh, the session. Um, we will first hear from uh, SCOS and uh, the infrastructure that we'll be presenting today. And after that, there will be a short Q&A specifically to ask for more information and um, ask uh, for some extra explanation um, about what SCOS is doing and what the infrastructures have to offer us. And then um, we will turn to our panel discussion. Um, we have our panel members uh, presenting themselves and uh, we will discuss more about um, how you can join, ideas about how we can present uh, the uh, work that we are doing and how we can join together to support open infrastructures um, very well into the future. Um, so um, I guess this is all from me for now. Um, let's move to Bianca Kramer, who will tell you more about SCOS and the work that we are doing. Bianca. Yes, thank you very much, Hilde. I will indeed very briefly introduce you to, uh, to SCOS. And by first presenting the challenge that, uh, that SCOS was started to address. And the challenge may, may be very familiar to, uh, to all of us, I think, here in the room who are using open infrastructures, who are interested in open infrastructures, knowing that many open infrastructures were created using short-term project money 
and um, their long-term sustainability is often a challenge. Add to that that the number of open access and open infrastructures has grown in number and usage, which is of course great, but it also amplifies that challenge. And that runs the risk of services um, either stagnating or downsizing or being acquired and paywalling. Which is of course not what we want when we want an equitable and inclusive research culture. So to address that challenge, uh, SCOS was started to really help sustain infrastructure to support the implementation of open science. And how does that work in practice? Um, what SCOS is doing as a community-led and governed organization is uh, take some of the work out of the hands of individual libraries or library consortia on deciding who to fund. What SCOS is doing is putting out uh, a yearly expression of interest for infrastructures to apply to become part of SCOS and then um, do an evaluation of those applications and selecting two or three infrastructures for each funding cycles and then presenting those infrastructures to universities, university libraries, university library consortia uh, to encourage them to fund those infrastructures. And also uh, in doing that, uh, that selection and in working with the infrastructures, one of the things we're also focusing on is to, um, to work towards, uh, to help to work towards good governance. That, that's a really important one. And to also help sustain longer uh, relationships with potential funders. So to ensure that long-term sustainability. What does that mean for, uh, for institutions? It means taking some of the guesswork away from uh, some of that selection away from among all those infrastructures, um, who should we fund? Uh, helping make those connections between uh, institutions and infrastructures. And I should emphasize that SCOS is not in itself uh, involved in um, mediating that subscriptions or th those payments. Institutions um, themselves uh, organize the payments with the infrastructures and often that's done for a three-year cycle to also in, um, guarantee a more stable uh, stable funding for that period so in the governing board of uh, of schools hilda already mentions that uh, she's part of that representing liber uh, there are many other organizations um, uh, representing research institutions and the libraries present and it's really um, global coverage there's representation from all continents except currently asia so um, really also um, making sure that the the voices and the selection and the ways cost is run really represents global interests Currently, um, over 330 institutions have pledged to SCOS from 24 countries, and there are 11 infrastructures so far that, uh, that are part of, of SCOS. And in total, uh, we have now recently passed the 5 million uh, euros uh, mark for funds pledged to the SCOS infrastructures. Who are these infrastructures? Uh, the first pilot cycle uh, started with Sharpa Romeo and uh, DOIJ. And after that, we have had uh, three more cycles with three infrastructures each. Each have their own uh, target, their own, own goals um, that they want to work with, with uh, the money collected uh, through the participation in SCOS. And as you can see for that uh, second cycle, that was uh, DRA Bay and OAPEN for open access books, open citations um, representing, well, advocating and facilitating open citations, PKP as a publishing platform. Um, then we had a cycle with uh, Archive, with uh, Redalek Amelica from Latin America and with DSpace. Those cycles are still uh, ongoing and you can see here the targets uh, reached for them that's still building up. And then this year, uh, late last year, we started the fourth cycle with the three infrastructures that you will hear more about in a minute, uh, Dwyat, La Referencia, and Roar. As you can see from this set, uh, these infrastructures are cover like different functions in the scholarly, infra, uh, scholarly communication ecosystem. They represent also different uh, regions um, of the world. So uh, together uh, also representing um, like a variety, a broad range of uh, important open science infrastructures. 
And with that, uh, I would like to, sh uh, to, to finish this uh, short presentation of SCOS. Any questions can be addressed uh, later in the Q&A. And I would actually like to give the word to Sarah Lippincott to first introduce uh, one of the three infrastructures of this cycle, Dryad. Thanks, Bianca. Dryad is an open international data publishing platform and community committed to the open availability and routine reuse of all research data. Dryad fully curates all data and metadata and publishes exclusively under a Creative Commons public domain license. We exist to serve the research community and normalize the open sharing and reuse of data, an essential step in achieving the benefits of open science. Open data provide evidence to support research articles and enable experts to interrogate, validate, and build upon new findings. And they allow researchers and communities, including those from well uh, from less well-resourced institutions and regions of the world, to work with data they might not be able to generate themselves. Next. Emerging data sharing guidance issued by policymakers and funders around the world asserts that simply posting data online or making it available upon request is not enough. Research data should be fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, and should be of sufficient quality to validate and replicate research findings. Dryad's robust curation process, our commitment to standards-based metadata, and continual improvement of our technology ensure that researchers can meet this standard. Next. Researchers around the world rely on Dryad and our fully curated publishing process to make their data discoverable and reusable now in, and into the future. Since our founding in 2008, we have curated and published nearly 50,000 data sets representing the work of nearly 200,000 researchers at nearly 70,000 institutions around the world. Our data sets are connected to research articles in over 1,200 leading academic journals. Next. Dryad publishes research data across domains and is a powerful conduit for data that doesn't have a home with a specialist repository. We publish only research data and work in collaboration with Zenodo to facilitate open, pub open publication of associated software and supplemental information, one of the many connections we maintain with other open source tools and organizations. Dryad's strengths are in the curation and standards-based open publication of research data, as well as our collaborative approach and community governance. Our curation process is best in class for generalist data publication. Our open source publishing platform represents the latest best practice for sharing data, connecting it to related research outputs and measuring impact. And our strategy for collaborating with other values aligned services rather than competing sets us apart. Through our relationships with academic publishers, we build data sharing directly into the manuscript submission workflow, capturing the data underlying scholarly research and simplifying the deposit process for authors. Next. Our team of curators reviews each data set for inclusion of required metadata that facilitates interoperability with other systems and downstream discovery and reuse. They also check that every data set may be opened with readily available software and that there is a readme file to guide future users seeking to build upon it. All of our data and metadata are also permanently stored in a, a Core Trust SEAL certified repository published under a CC0 license and accessible through Dryad's uh, front end interface at datadryad.org and our open API. Next. We are supported in part by our institutional and publisher membership program, representing over 100 research institutes, colleges, universities, government agencies, academic publishers, scholarly societies, and university presses, who entrust thousands of their data sets to us each year. Next. Dryad is a truly international platform. This chart shows the geographic distribution of data set authors represented in Dryad. About a third of our submitters are based in the United States. However, European countries round out nine of the top 15 locations of depositors. Together, these European uh, countries represent 31.97% of data sets in Dryad, so equivalent to researchers based in the United States um, and would actually exceed uh, the, that proportion of researchers if we included all of the, the European nations. Uh, next slide. We are a member-driven nonprofit and one of the first adopters of the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. This means that we take seriously our commitments to responsive governance that provides accountability to our stakeholders, 
the long-term sustainability of our services and infrastructure, and ensuring the preservation of our data in the event that our operations cease. You can read our detailed self-evaluation against the POSI principles on our blog. Dryad's revenue is generated from our core mission activities, curation, publication, and preservation of research data. This revenue comes from membership fees or from a data publishing charge at the point of dataset publication. We are committed to building an exemplary data publishing service and community that is right-sized and low cost. It is our commitment to ensure that costs and services are appropriate for both the community and for Dryad sustainability. This is an ongoing process of generating sustaining revenue through a diversified rev revenue model of data publishing charges and memberships. Next. Institutions and specifically libraries around the world already invest in Dryad because we help them realize their open research strategy. We help them leverage the traction we have with research communities to promote open data publishing and best practices and take the guesswork out of complying with funder policies. We are an established, reliable, outsourced and affordable solution that is nonprofit and community led. We complement local and national data repositories and initiatives and can integrate with local uh, data infrastructure. We actively engage and consult with our library community to co-create our services, features, and operations. The UNESCO recommendation for open science calls for investment in and resources for open science commons, specifically technical and digital infrastructures and related services. This is because the grand challenges of the 21st century are interdisciplinary and international. Dryad seeks to provide open, reusable data to inform action and policy on a global scale. Next. With SCOS funding, we aim to drive adoption of data publishing, grow an open global community, offer a more nimble Dryad service, support researcher needs, and innovate. Next. An investment from your institution through SCOS will help Dryad resource more core functions that so, that, so that we can navigate current demands and establish a strong position for the future. Specifically, we will be able to invest in growth in outreach and promotion to interested investors, invigorate our core stakeholders through community engagement, and stay at the front of best practice for data sharing and building best practice for data reuse. SCOS support will enable Dryad to invest aggressively in growing our community of support and responding to increasing and changing demands of a highly competitive environment. We're grateful for the opportunity to work with SCOS funders to build a more open and equitable future for research data. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. We will move to Latoro Matos about the friendship. Thank you, Bianca. Uh, well, uh, hello, everyone. I am Lautaro Matos, the Executive Director of La Referencia, which is the Open Science Network Repository, net, uh, repository network of Latin America. Uh, we are an association of government authorities of science, technology, and innovation. We were funded in the in uh, ten years ago by the signing of a cooperation agreement as a result of the uh, International Development Bank project uh, that was led by Red Clara, which is our uh, net, uh, network uh, research and education network. Sorry, uh, we have now twelve countries uh, participating, uh, Latin American countries plus Spain. Uh, we added Spain because the traditional uh, scientific communication and, and collaboration tradition and because the language, of course. So uh, we are uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So uh, I want to point three of our main uh, points here. That is uh, the first that we are a forum. We are not only a technical initiative, but a, a political initiative that uh, reunites uh, governments and we work as a forum for discussion and implementation of open science policies in, in our countries. Uh, for example, we are now discussing and working around the uh, UNESCO recommendation and how to implement them in, in our region. Our main goal is to give visibility to the scientific production of our, of our region at global level. That's because we work as a as a, as a network with national national aggregators that are built on top of our platform in the countries, and we aggregate those uh, national aggregators 
in a regional aggregator and we and we shared all the metadata of our region with other aggregators such as open airways and other global initiatives so uh, we do all this based on an open source platform that we developed uh, in the in the last years and is available for everyone for to use even we are working with 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 african uh, research networks in order to share our knowledge for them to implement our platform in in, in africa also portugal is using uh, our platform as part of their national open science portal uh, and of course uh, we are always trying to collaborate and engage with with more region and more 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 users uh, i want to say that this according to a core uh, survey is the most used platform, aggregator platform in the in the world for the moment. Uh, next, Bianca, please. So, uh, about sustainability, uh, our operation I've, I'm financing exclusively with the annual contribution of the member countries, and we also had a occasional funding grants from projects like Open Air or or other collaboration project that uh, we use that for, for push our, our, our development forward. So this budget, this essential budget supports the, the basic development and the ongoing maintenance of the aggregation software, our periodical meetings and our, or our discussions. But uh, to move forward with the expansion of the service, the technological updating and consolidate the platform with the, with the challenge that we are facing now, regarding uh, uh, the UNESCO recommendation and other things that are happening globally. So we require an additional source of funding. So uh, otherwise uh, we have risk of, of running out of, of, the, of, the, of the challenge that, that, that we're facing. So for, that's because it's a very important this, this, this is cost, uh, process for us. And we would like to share the two main projects that we are working on yeah, with this SCOS funding. Next, please, Bianca. So the first one is uh, we are trying to be the decentralized, sustainably global persistent identifier service based on blockchain. This is a, this is a very innovative idea that we are working uh, with our national Brazilian node. We are already working on that and we have uh, an, a paper, uh, uh, published in uh, a preprint paper, paper published in, in Senodo that you, you, you could go there and, and read more about that. But it's more or less, it's the idea that of we need not only persistent, but unique and the duplicated identifiers because we need to, better, to build better uh, research graph and indicators in order to face the research assessment challenges that we have in our region. Uh, we have a lack of PID coverage in the in the global south because the the cost that it's supposed to our institution. So we need to build another another alternative, not not a competitor, but a competitive, but an alternative way to put PIDs to to our scientific production. Um, and also we we saw that most persistent identifier systems are based on a centralized model. So. We are trying to build this as a public good for any institution to participate in a blockchain network with, 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 with resources. And then the information will be decentralized, not in hands of one, but in the, in the hands of all the, all the participants. And we think that is more sustainable with time. So we, uh, we are expecting to, to make more model advances this year. We are going to present some results in the open repository conference this year. Next, Bianca, please. And the other component that we are developing is it is, uh, is building a usage statistic components. We, we, we had a, a very good experience with open air working together in, in work in, in building this uh, usage statistics infrastructure based on Matomo. So uh, we did a pilot with them and we then developed a regional aggregator for usage statistics. And we have several components now deployed in the repository network. And we want to, uh, the, to, to, to use that base 
in order to, to build uh, better components and deploy that components, not only in the repository network, but in all the, all the, the, the other open science ecosystem actors or, or systems. And we want to share that components with the rest of the community. We had been in touch also with some experience in France uh, regarding using Matomo for usage statistics. So we, 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 we think that it would be very useful to, to engage with more people uh, working around this and, and make uh, open components for, for the global network. Uh, next, Bianca, or this, ah, this, this was my letter. So I've, I will be glad to answer questions. Uh, thank you very much. We will get back to you with questions later um, after we've listened to Maria. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for being here today. My name is Maria Gould, and I support persistent identifier services at the California Digital Library, which is one of the three partner organizations that operates ROAR. ROAR is the research organization registry, and we provide an open and community-driven solution to the problem of identifying research organization affiliations and connecting them to research outputs. Next slide, please. So we know that for many stakeholders across the research landscape, institutions, publishers, funders, libraries, et cetera, the ability to discover and to report on research activities is an increasingly important and crucial task. And to accomplish this task really depends on the ability to drill down at the institutional level and connect these research outputs to the institutions where they are affiliated. Next slide, please. The problem, however, with tracking these outputs is that it requires knowing what the researcher affiliations are. And the problem with researcher affiliations is that this data is not represented consistently because organization names can be written in multiple ways or names can change over time and other reasons, or because this data is only available in commercial databases or subscription services. Or in other cases, this metadata just simply does is, is not available and does not exist because it's not collected. So these are some of the challenges that we are trying to address with ROAR. Next slide, please. So one of the ways that we do this, the, the core way that we do this is by providing a unique and open and globally available identifier that anyone can use to indicate a researcher affiliation and easily link it to research outputs, which can then also be linked to researchers and other objects of research to enable cleaner and more consistent metadata to flow through various discovery systems and citation indexes. So I'm showing on this slide here an example of the integration that Dryad built. And I uh, just wanted to acknowledge our fellow SCOS participant here and uh, showcasing this example of, of the power of an open identifier for affiliations. So Dryad collects ROAR IDs for the affiliations of researchers submitting data sets, and then they include those ROAR IDs in the metadata that they deposit when a DOI is registered for that data. And because of that, this metadata is now openly available in systems that harvest DOI information. And then we can easily track all of the outputs associated in this case with Newcastle University in, in this example, and to be able to link it and connect it to other identifiers such as this researcher's ORCID or other kinds of metadata that might also be available for this data set, such as funding information, granting information, related works, et cetera. So next slide, please. So just to take a little bit of a step back and tell you about what's in the ROAR registry, we are an open and global registry. We have IDs for more than 100,000 research organizations around the world. In the example here, this is a screenshot of our front end search interface. We make all of the data available here in this interface, as well as through a public API and data dump. 
In addition to the ROAR ID, we include descriptive metadata to support discovery and disambiguation in various systems and integrations. So you can see in this example, uh, we especially focus on having different versions of organization names and multilingual metadata because we know that research is a global enterprise. We want to make sure that the metadata that we have in ROAR is as rich as possible so that when IDs are integrated in various aspects of scholarly infrastructure, uh, we can easily connect it to the uh, types of searches and discovery systems that might be in use and might be relying on different versions of an organization name. We also really prioritize interoperability of ROAR IDs by including crosswalks to other identifiers. So in the example here, you can see uh, equivalent identifiers in the ISNI database, the CrossRep funder registry and Wikidata, as well as GRID, which was the original seed data for ROAR. And we're updating the registry through a community-based curation process on a rolling basis, approximately once a month to make sure that the registry is as up-to-date as possible whenever people need it. Next slide, please. So the, I, some of you may be familiar with other types of organization identifiers or might already be working with other types of identifiers. So I just want to clarify a few things that make ROAR's approach particularly distinctive and unique. And the first thing is that ROAR is completely open. All of the ROAR data is available under a CC0 public domain waiver. We make the data available through our open API and data dump. We are also like Dryad and early signatory to the principles of open scholarly infrastructure and take very seriously our commitment to making our data and infrastructure openly available to everyone for the long term. Second point of distinction is that ROAR specifically is designed to be used with other persistent identifiers and other open infrastructures. So it is the primary identifier for organizations supported in Crossref and in Datasite and in ORCID, for instance. And that interoperability and the way in which ROAR functions as this puzzle piece that connects to other metadata is a really key part of what we're trying to do. Thirdly, ROAR is specifically focused on identifying affiliations and being able to make connections between research organizations and research outputs to really solve what we call the affiliation use case and help make this, this tracking of research more efficient uh, and, and more powerful. And lastly, ROAR was and, and still is developed and operated as a community initiative. So this includes how we operate it. We operate it as a joint collaboration between California Digital Library, Crossref, and Datasite. And we also work with uh, close circles of community advisory groups to help us determine strategic directions for ROAR and also participate in the curation activities involved in maintaining the registry. And all of that uh, community engagement and participation is really core to what we are doing to make sure that that ROAR continues to serve the broad needs of our global community of stakeholders who depend on having access to this kind of metadata. Next slide, please. So we're very uh, grateful and honored to be participating in SCOS in this cycle, and that's primarily to be able to raise awareness of the importance of open infrastructure for affiliations. And what we're really aiming to do through participating in SCOS is to scale and sustain the growth that we are seeing at this particularly crucial time to support those who are working to implement uh, and, and use ROAR IDs. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of how ROAR is growing and expanding right now, at the end of 2022, we were seeing ROAR API usage at about 13 million requests per month, and that was up from about 6 million per month at the end of 2021, just a year prior, and 3 million per month at the end of 2020, the year before that. Uh, now in 2023, we're already seeing about 15 million requests per month with the API, so we're seeing that usage and, and need of our data is just continuing to grow, and so one of the uh, specific goals and needs that we have is to keep scaling our technical infrastructure to keep up with growing usage. And that really connects to the second 
primary goal and need that we have right now, which is how we can best encourage and support widespread adoption and use of ROAR IDs. We know that the more ROAR IDs that are out there in research infrastructure, the better off we all are as a research community to have access to open and clean and consistent information about research. And so it's especially critical that we can drive adoption and implementation of ROAR IDs across the research landscape right now so that we can collectively realize the downstream benefits of the reporting and, and tracking and metadata richness that ROAR can support. So we're looking at how we can help support matching and implementations and mapping back file content to ROARs and all of the different ways in which we can populate the ecosystem with these IDs and metadata. So with your support, we're really looking forward to, to accelerating that work and making it possible to, to really enrich our collective research infrastructure with this information. Thank you very much and look forward to questions and comments. And thank you, uh, Maria, uh, very interesting as well. So um, let's look at the chat here. Hey, the chat is empty. Um, does that mean that nobody has a question for our um, four presenters? If you do have a question, you can either speak up, raise your hand, or put a question in the chat. So no questions, um, but I have some. <laughs> I um, um, we do have enough time. Yes, we have. Um, uh, I was wondering, um, Sarah, in your presentation, uh, you said uh, we take the guesswork out of funder policies. Um, that sentence triggered me. Uh, what did you mean by that? Um, so we, you know, we are. Dryad is paying attention to policy developments in the United States, but also elsewhere in the world and working uh, and we have aspirations to work more closely with funders worldwide. We're already working very closely with funders in the US to ensure that Dryad's standards for metadata and services and the assurances that we make about about uh, the um, the quality of the data that we publish conform to the expectations of funders. Um, so, so we we are compliant, for example, with the National Institutes of Health data sharing policy by default. So, if an author deposits data with us, they 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 don't need to worry about whether they've done everything right to conform to that policy because we take care of that for them. Our technology by design conforms to the desirable characteristics laid out by the funder and our curators ensure that there's sufficient metadata, that the data can be opened um, and, and, and reused. Um, so we we help to, um, we, we don't think that should be the responsibility of individual researchers to know the details and to, to keep, to have to evaluate um, the platform to make sure that it conforms to every detail of what their funder expects. This is really interesting. Just that would be enough for most of the researchers that I know to find this a helpful, helpful solution because it's often very complicated. So that's really interesting. Um, please let me know if this raises any more questions with you. If not, um, I want to ask um, to um, Natoro. Can you explain us um, why um, any institutions in the rest of the world, not South America or Latin America, um, would want to invest in uh, La Referencia? Is it worldwide focused? Of course, yes. Uh, as I said, we uh, there are many reasons, but one of, I, I will mention a couple. One is that we are working for visibilization of our production, but in that, in that way, we are providing content to the global uh, open science network. We, part of our, our, our metadata is an opener. So when, uh, when the researchers search for something in the opener graph uh, in Europe or in the opener services, they are searching and, and will find production 
that is not only Latin American, but also in collaboration with European uh, research. So we are, our, our information is complementary for the European information in order to have a, a broader view of the global research. And on the other hand, we are looking for funding. This, this, this alternative solution for PIDs because we think that we, we need to build some services as, as public goods, not only for Latin America, but for the global uh, open science ecosystem. So we want to provide this and connect these services with the existing PID services in order to, to, to make uh, a PID uh, decentralized uh, service for, for everyone, not just for Latin America. And finally, uh, we are thinking the same for the of our of 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 the usage statistics. We are already working with Open Air. We are already uh, already sharing our usage events uh, with with Open Air. But uh, these components could help to normalize the idea of how to measure uh, usage statistics, what, how to build a methodology to 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 build indicators and then measure the impact of our repositories, uh, journals, and so on in the, in the usage uh, statistics in the global also. So I think that is important not only for Latin America, but we can put our grain of sand for the open science uh, ecosystem globally. Thank you for the question. And, and science is internationally, and we yeah. should be working more worldwide than just uh, uh, being Western centered. So that's really important to to know this, and it's uh, uh, definitely a very good reason to invest. Uh, uh, I agree. And and Maria, and does that go for Roar as well? Uh, the worldwide focus, or is it mainly US uh, based? Because if you want to have all aff affiliations, that can be rather men much to include the whole world into that. Yes, indeed. But but our our mission is is just that to to be a global registry that anyone around the world can use and benefit from. And so we're really grateful that we were able to start Roar with a seed data file from the Grid database, which already had very broad coverage of organizations around the world. And one of the things that we're specifically doing right now with all of this data that we've inherited is looking at where do we have gaps or where do we have opportunities to enrich the metadata even more. So to take one example, we've been working with Lautaro and with the La Referencia uh, repository networks to specifically analyze the coverage we have in ROAR for Latin American research organizations and review. We, we do have uh, a lot of coverage already, but we've been working closely with representatives from La Referencia to see uh, if there are any organizations that are missing or to see what kind of improvements we can make to the metadata that we have, like adding different versions of organization names to promote discoverability and things like that. So we take ROAR's position as, as a globally available registry very seriously. And that's one of the values that we can provide to the global science community. We also know, you know on the topic of, of interoperability that we, we work closely with those who may be maintaining more um, local level or national level databases of, of research organizations. And one of the one of the benefits of ROAR is that can it can really function as a kind of linking or or bridging identifier that can can really supplement that kind of local level, regional level, um, national level uh, research research tracking. And ROAR essentially functions then as a kind of common language we can all speak <laughs> uh, to really rationalize organization metadata across this, you know, very diverse and, and global research community that we operate in. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. And I see a reaction by Inge van Nieuwenburg. Do you want to get this reaction yourself? Oh yeah, I can uh, do that if you want yeah. to. <laughs> 
Yeah, I just wanted to say that it would indeed be good if the, for adoption that you have the resources to uh, to address some workshops or in, uh, join some um, initiatives in countries so that we know in the countries what you have to do to optimize for. Mm -hmm. So that would indeed be be very good, I think. Um, here in Flanders, for example, we are more and more adopting ROAR in, uh, in many systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I appreciate your comment. And I, I don't think we've been in touch, but I've been in touch with other colleagues um, managing Flemish research um, data. And we've been working hard to, to um, update all of the information and support the work that you're doing. There's, you know, the I, you know, I think scaling, scaling and supporting adoption is one of the reasons why we're happy to be participating in SCOS because it, it is a, a lot of work to, you know, to try to drive these efforts and we're doing what we can, but we're a very small team. And so we really are relying on community champions and representatives around the world to help with that as well. Uh, but we are doing a number of different events on an ongoing basis to try to support that, including an in-person workshop in Argentina next month and um, co-locating events at various conferences as well as, as virtual events um, all the time. So I will uh, drop a couple of links in the chat to um, anyone who is interested in seeing what kind of events are coming up or if anybody wants to get in touch about specific uh, meetings or workshops we might be able to organize to support yes. adoption. Well, that, that's wonderful, um, uh, Maria, and, and I do think this is so important. It's, it's a good example of how one small, small detail, knowing how you would write your own organization's name correctly, has so, so much global impact. Um, our researchers do not always know that. In the meantime, we have um, solved some misunderstanding about refer referencia. Mexico is included. So um, that was already sold in the chat. Is there anything else before I think? No. Um, I think we can now move to our panel um, because hearing about these very interesting uh, infrastructures, it might be useful, or I'm sure it will, um, be um, that we hear about institutions that are making decisions about how um, to uh, pledge within uh, um, SCOS uh, supported infrastructures. How do you make that decision? Uh, we know how difficult it is to um, spend um, money on these type of new infrastructures. It all sometimes sounds a little bit like we have more than enough money to spend, but we don't, but we do want to spend the part, the budget that we have uh, on worthwhile uh, infrastructures. And um, this dilemma of how to do that uh, will be pre presented by our three uh, panelists. Um, I am fortunate to say that we have Helen Dobson uh, here and Susan Riley and uh, Demi Verbeke. They are first going to uh, introduce themselves and say a little bit about this topic. And then we will open up again for a general discussion. Um, do we do this in this order? Helen, will you start? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Hilde. Um, so my name is Helen Dobson and I am, um, my role is called Licensing Portfolio Specialist for Research. Uh, and I work at JISC. So for those of you who aren't aware, JISC is a member organisation and we support UK universities and colleges. And that's with a really wide range of services. Um, I work in JISC's licensing team. We focus on negotiating agreements for content and software. Um, we're a really large consortium. We have over 150 higher education, so university members and, and other research organisations. Um, and these range from really small teaching focused institutions to really large uh, research intensive universities like Oxford, Cambridge uh, universities. Um, in my role, I manage some license, a number of licensing managers. They, nego uh, they negotiate open access agreements. Um, and that's with a range of publishers. So it can be transformative agreements with large commercial publishers, but also uh, smaller uh, society publishers. It can be open access publishers like PLOS operating an APC model. Um, it can be diamond open access publishers like the Open Library of Humanities. 
We also have some um, open infrastructure agreements that we make available. So um, directory of open access books, archive, th those kind of things. Um, currently, my priorities are looking ahead. So looking beyond the current uh, open access agreements and I'm involved in the DIMAS project as well, which obviously is looking at um, diamond open access for the future. Is that all you want me to say for now? Because we've got we've got a little bit more, I think, to add. Is that all right? Yes, this is perfectly all right to start with. Um, uh, we'll to hear more from you later. Uh, but then we're moving first to Susan Riley. Hi, thanks, Hilda. And hello from Dublin, everyone. Um, my name is Susan Riley, and I'm the director of IRL, the I Irish um, uh, uh, Research e Library Consortium, uh, serving universities. In Ireland, and I should say I'm also the co-chair of the Open Access Working Group in the National Open Research Forum, which is the national coordinating body for building research capacity or open research capacity in Ireland. Um, so I'm here with, with two hats on, really. So first of all, um, a little bit about Ireland and how we, or IRL and how we support um, uh, open research infrastructure. IRL uh, adopted the Libre principles on open access negotiations in 2019 and began to pursue transformative open access agreements. And this switch uh, towards open access and the need for us to gather data on our institution's publication outputs and on open access publishing has really driven our engagement, not just with open access publishing, but actually with the scholarly communication infrastructure underlying it and with open research infrastructure. Um, we now support the use of persistent identifiers because we're host of the Irish ORCID Consortium, and we are developing the National Open Access Monitor for North. Um, so we're really engaging more with um, open research infrastructure, um, I guess putting more capacity there, and in fact, building open infrastructure ourselves. Um, in terms of our purely financial contribution, um, we have been supporting uh, DOAJ, Wappen, uh, DOAB and, and Sherpa Romeo through, through SCOS. We decided to do this in uh, 2021. And really the reason that we decided to do this was kind of bottom up. We were and are quite successful with our, our, our transformative agreements and we wanted to support scholarly communications and open infrastructure more broadly, uh, our members did, um, and to support, to give researchers more cho choice in terms of how they engage with open research. We're now in a different position today in that the National Open Research Forum has a roadmap for, uh, for open research, and there it specifically calls for um, the supporting international open infrastructure. Um, so we're in a different landscape today than where we were when we first uh, supported SCOS. And I'm, I guess I'll talk about that a little, a little bit more in the discussion. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, so let's move to Belgium. Uh, Demi Verbeke, do you want to introduce yourself? Thank you, Hilde. So as said, I'm Demi Verbeke from Leuven in Belgium, where I basically wear three hats. First and foremost, I am head of ARTES, which is the unit within Kyle Leuven Libraries, which focuses on the arts and humanities. Uh, second, I'm also a member of the management team of Kyle Leuven Libraries, where I, together with other colleagues, pay special attention to what we do around collections and open science. And third, I combine this com position within the library with an appointment as uh, associate professor of open scholarship at the Faculty of Arts. Um, now, what do we do in Leuven that is particularly relevant for this webinar? Uh, since 2018, we have what is called the Kyle Leuven Fund for Fair Open Access, which is essentially a separate budget line in the library, which is used exclusively for nonprofit and community driven forms of publishing and alternative approaches to scholarly communication. And having a fund like that for us uh, offers a solution for two common complaints. I hear from libraries which are looking into providing financial support for open infrastructure. Although I would actually call them excuses rather than complaints. And the first one is, we don't have the money for this. And the second one is, we do not know where to start and how to do this. 
Um, and for us, having this fund means that we always have a little bit of budget set aside for this, which cannot be spent on a commercial approach to open publishing, but is designated to support approaches, like the ones that are now being suggested by SCOS. Um, and since we have been doing this since 2018, we have also gathered expertise in building a portfolio, expertise in how to select what to support, experience in how we can handle this administratively, which also means we have built up the confidence to now start supporting similar initiatives to the collection budget of our discipline specific uh, libraries rather than via the central fund. So we really believe in this approach, although I am the first one to say that our support for open structure for research, uh, open infrastructure for research should not be limited to having a small central fund run by one or two specialists. There is one thing, and that's the last thing I'm going to say that I would have done differently. And that is the name of the fund. Um, the name Fund for Fair Open Access gives the impression that we are only supporting monographs or particular journals or particular publishers. But what we have done since the beginning is actually support infrastructure as well which we now continue to do, for instance, by recent editions of open knowledge maps and research equals. So if I would start again, I would probably call it the Kyle Leuven Fund for Fair Open Scholarship or something like that. Um, other than that, I can only recommend our approach to other libraries because it has enabled us to sign up for a lot of what has been offered through SCOS. Thank you. Thank you very much, Demi. Um, in between, I'm always looking at the chat and or if anyone wants to ask something. So just interrupt me if you uh, want, um, but and we'll start with some uh, more questions to our panel, um, especially about the way that you've been uh, investing in open uh, infrastructure. Is this just ad hoc? Is it what comes up, what SCOS tells you to invest in, or do you have a kind of a plan a uh, um, future looking systematic approach to how to invest in these open infrastructures. Demi, do you want to react? Yeah, I do, well, it has changed a little bit over time. In the beginning, 2018, uh, it was very much down to us finding out things through conferences or looking at Twitter or things that were being suggested by us and then doing the vetting ourselves. Um, now there's now a lot more that we can just we can see what Scott suggests. You have Oasis by Lirasis. You have uh, what Jisk is doing now. Uh, it makes it a lot easier for libraries to just see, like for instance, now the uh, a very recent development is also the Open Book Collective, where you can basically go and see and okay, these things are already vetted by others that we trust so we can just sign up it makes it easy administratively and it makes it easy sort of to not be too scared about getting it wrong because that was in the very beginning that was the issue of like a, how do you select something and how can you be certain that you trust this i always said well, like we don't want to keep we want to keep the vetting the small because I don't have I don't want to have five people full time looking into these things. I don't have the means to this. Uh, we just go for a gut thing, and these are contracts of one year, small investments. I, I always had something like we we should not be too scared about getting this wrong. Um, uh, and what we were are still actually pretty much driven by is also suggestions of our research community of that we know that our professors our students ask for this and use this. Uh, and that is typically how we prioritize what is like here. Yeah, we do not sign up for everything that SCOS is suggesting. It depends a little bit what gets like, yeah, what, other what other librarians are saying or what our researchers are saying. We need this and that gets on the top of our list. Mm -hmm. yeah, this uh, sounds familiar, but um, Helen, Susan, do you recognize what they may say? Helen? Uh Yes, I mean, I, I'm in a different position and uh, at GIST, what I didn't say in my little introduction was um, we, although we're a member organisation, the uh, all the agreements that we make available to our members are opt in, you know, so we, we don't, um, we don't sort of pay for negotiation, uh, we don't pay for agreements for everybody. Um, so that that's that I guess in terms of what we do this, this two approaches. So, so what one, one is probably more um, ad hoc than the other. So we're involved in lots of projects. And Demi's just mentioned um the open open book collective. So we're involved in in you know in that in that project behind the scenes. We're involved in in the coping project. And there's you know there's going to be open infrastructure coming out of these projects. Um, 
And I think when that happens, then that's when we take a more ad hoc approach. I mean, that sounds kind of counterintuitive to say the outcome of a project is ad hoc, but, you know, it's not kind of within a cycle, I suppose. Um, but what we've been trying to do and, um, we've, we, you know, we've, we've been supporting or making agreements for open infrastructure available to our members for quite a long time now. Um, we've been trying to sort of um, make that more efficient, standardise the approach to, to that, because our, our feeling is, and, and I'm not saying that libraries are telling us this, but it feels like it might be true. Um, the more the more things that, that libraries are being offered, you know, the more opportunities to fund more different types of uh, open infrastructure or diamond open access or, or whatever, so, you know, could be subscribed to open. The more difficult that is if that's spread out through the year because you know budgets are finite so what we tried to do that last year was bring together our diamond open access um opportunities and sort of say at one point in the year here's here's everything where you would need this kind of money for what we are calling community funding models so last year it, it sort of aligned quite nicely with this with the scos funding cycle you know we were man we managed to do that and bring together um a webinar where the scos uh, a bit like today you know where, where the scos initiatives came and spoke to our members um so so that feels like how we want to you know the the, the process that we want to is to be more um systematic in that way yes thank you very much Helen. it's a different perspective on that susan um, yes, so I, I think, you know, what Demi and, and Helen have said kind of uh, resonates there is, um, you know, we don't have a, a, a pot, a defined pot of money set aside to say this is what we're going to spend on, on uh, open infrastructure. And even if we did, um, the landscape is so uh, changing constantly, it's very difficult to say this is what we're going to spend on. For the next few years so we you know what's important is that we have um we get input from our communities uh to, to help us prioritize and say what's important so demi mentioned you know hearing from researchers and other libraries about what's what's important to invest in um so for us um the national open research forum is very important and that is identified um really uh diamond Supporting diamond open access publishing as as a priority, and you know, giving researchers um, supporting diversity in the landscape and giving researchers the choice, um, and is it's continuing the conversation about what's important in the research landscape. So that will inform where we can invest. We're not going to suddenly have a new pot of money to to um, to spend on open research infrastructures. So it's important that we have some other way to um, uh, prioritize, but uh, it's hearing the voices of researchers and other stakeholders um, getting their feedback, that, that's so important. Uh, Susan, you're talking about the research infrastructures, um, but it's still library budgets that you're depending on, or is that going more broad? And that might be a question for all of us as well. Um, if we as libraries um, are the only ones continuing to fund this, um, there's something not right about that, isn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think this landscape is changing and there's so much new infrastructure, not just because we're embracing open, but because, you know, research, um, uh, there's more investment in research, there's more international research. So there's a lot more funding, I think, going into research. and the infrastructure, but not necessarily the infrastructure that support researchers, research and libraries know that better than anyone because our budgets don't go up necessarily with that spending on research. So there does need to be a conversation at that level. OK, here's how much we're spending on research and, you know, here's how much we need to invest in in research infrastructure. So it's not as simple as saying libraries can reallocate what they're spending on um, their spending on publishing, for example, or on subscriptions to open infrastructure. This is a bigger um, question of su sustainability. Um, and I, so I think it's really important that we engage in those policy agendas, um, you know, at national and international level. Um, uh, 
which I would say because that's what <laughs> what I do. But um, I think you know the funding follows policy, um, and that's so we we have a but what we can still uh, make small investment and 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 commit to certain aspects. Of re- we shouldn't just throw our hands up in the air and say we can't do it. We can still um, make changes within our budget, but it has to be um, again driven by what our communities want and need. We're here to support researchers um, and their access to information and their knowledge creation. Absolutely, we can take the first step, but it's too big for us to do it by ourselves. So, governments and and other types of programs have to join us. Is there anyone in the audience that has experiences in this area or wants to say something about this topic? Maybe I can add to that, that like from my own personal perspective from the library, I actually do not particularly mind that in an open access context, our collection budget is now being spent differently. Uh, I do not want to spend that amount of money on paywall access. I can repurpose that part of that money. Of course, what I absolutely do want, and I think we should grasp that opportunity from libraries, we should not just move the budget from a a reader pays to an author pays model and say the library is going to pay for that. We should take the opportunity to to actually weigh in on the market. Otherwise, we're just just going to spend the same amount of money with the same publishers as always. We will not have solved anything except for the fact that we have created more open access, but we have not really solved it, uh, anything else. It's just that we should vote with our money and rather than paying, for instance, for APCs, I much rather pay for diamond open access models or actually for uh, infrastructure that, that facilitates then a scholarly communication. And I'd rather repurpose the money from the library into that way than to spend it on APCs. Yes, yes, that's really a, a step. Well, I would much rather step out a few big deals and repurpose that money. Uh, so it's difficult to take that step, definitely. And Helen, do you also um, uh, focus on broadening out your um, uh, institutions or organizations that you work with? Uh, yes, I mean, we, in terms of decision making, you know, what we do, what we prioritize at GIST, we, we, we have some strategic groups, some very high level strategic groups, which include very senior university leaders. Um, they also include uh, representatives from the major UK funders and and other other organisations in the UK. So we're having that conversation in a sort of joined up way. Um, and I suppose the importance of bringing those senior strategic leaders into that discussion is is that they can then go and have that conversation, be an advocate really for what we're talking about at you know in, in GISC meetings within their own communities and really you know try and move the conversation along. Um, uh, in terms of having the funders in the room, that, that's an interesting one. I, I'm, I'm not seeing at the moment that we've had much leverage with with getting them to change what they do. Um, but the, the the major fund at the moment in the UK in 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 the UK is from UKRI, and this supports open access essentially. But the block grant that goes to institutions is there's almost um, a freedom, if you like, to spend to spend parts of that block grant in the way that that kind of achieves open access. Um, and if, and if an institution is confident enough, then they will be able to make the case, you know, that we, we need RAWs to, to, do, to do X or we use Dryad to do Y, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it does require them to kind of be bold enough to do that, really. It's not, you know, it's not spelled out for them. And, and we see different behaviour from different institutions. You know, there are natural leaders in this space like, like Demi. Um, and we see in the UK that... Libraries are always looking for an example, you know, who's done this well? What what, how, what can we learn from them? Uh, you know, how do we do this? What's the problem we're trying to solve? Um, and so we try to facilitate those kind of connections really as well. You know, where are the local case studies? Um, and, and, and kind of, it's it's still happening within the, in the library, but I think what's missing for me is open research is, is an institutional endeavor and a strategy is owned by the institution. 
But what I don't think I've seen, and I, I don't know if that means it doesn't exist, but I haven't seen an implementation plan that's fully costed that says this is how we will achieve the open research strategy. You know, the conversation is very much still, this is how we will achieve the open access element of it. Um, and I keep pushing for that. <laughs> so if anyone's got any examples, I'd love to see them. Good question. Anyone's, anyone has any experiences or suggestions here? And within the panel, if you are looking for good examples also to offer our audience, um, do you have any um, uh, pointers, anything that you and can uh, suggest to the others in the audience um, to convince your university leaders or your main researchers to um, that you should invest in uh, um, this kind of open infrastructures or that we have to decide within your institutions to spend more budget on these kind of um, new um, uh, funding opportunities. Well, two arguments I typically use and I have used for years is one is that, and that's an argument that CFOs of universities completely get is it's just smart management to not put all your eggs in one basket in all business model. You need to make sure that you uh, like, yeah, maintain a diversity in the market. So is it so much to ask to use a small percentage of the budget to free up to spend on infrastructure and on buy books and spend on APCs to free that up to support also the alternatives? At the very least, it will give us an argument in negotiations with the big players. Look, there is still alternatives alive. We can always pick the alternatives. And that's an argument that actually uh, that a lot of managers get like yes this makes sense to maintain the diversity of the market a second argument that i also used is a very it sounds cynical but actually i i don't mean it cynical at all is with this relatively small investment which we then we we market everything that we do from kyle Leuven, and kyle Leuven libraries in the field of open science under one flag and we can say look this university is doing and trying to do a good job in this field and we all know that this is lots of where Europe is looking for, like we need, and people with ERC grants are looking at the university, which university is doing a good job in open science. It's like, this is going to help to put Leuven on the market as an open science player. And that too is an argument that university leaders get, whether they believe in open science or not, it's good for the image of the, the university. And it sounds cynical, but that's the way the world works. Yeah. That's a really strong one. Um, I'm looking at the time uh, we set this webinar to be for 75 minutes. Uh, it feels to me that we've just started, but um, uh, we do have to um, make some room for some final questions or remarks. Anyone from the audience still wants to take this final opportunity to have a question or a remark? Okay. Um, last minute but um anyone in the panel wants to say something specifically about th these three infrastructures that are up right now why should we all invest of in all three of these in this funding round i think i think the point that i haven't made that's on, on my list really is um that this aligns with a kind of social responsibility agenda, you know, and I think that that would speak to institutions. Absolutely, really important. Susan, Demi, any last things that you want to give the audience? Um, well, I, I would just say that um, this is about showing leadership, you know, um, support put your money where your mouth is and show leadership in the open research uh, arena that's how i would argue it and i actually mean it um, yeah we have to show that leadership to move to an open and um uh world where equity and open knowledge is um, right there for everyone uh, bianca has a final share a slide for us with um, suggestions of next steps for anyone that wants to join us. Bianca? Yeah, exactly. Um, just following up on uh, all the good conversations, if 
you are as a library or as an institution or as a library consortium interested in funding any of these infrastructures that we've presented to you today, then this is the way to do it. On the websites are links to the information for all of these infrastructures with the contact details and also with the financial details, or you can just uh, contact SCOS directly using the information on this slide. So we're really happy for uh, all your contribution and also really interested in continuing this conversation and helping broadening uh, support for open infrastructure. Thank you, Bianca and Mary. Uh, big thank you to all our speakers this afternoon and to our audience to have joined us uh, today. And you know where to find us, you know uh, where to give us your money. And, uh, and let's uh, move to a, an open world uh, together. So um, have a good uh, day today and evening. Thank you.